Nigerian oil. And then we will discuss the oil economy, looking at um, the relationship between the Nigerian oil uh, production and then the global economy and then the US economy. And then we will also look at um, Nigeria's pollution, uh, oil pollution profile. And then, and it's, um, it's um, contribution to um, global warming and climate change. Um, we will look at oil spills and gas flaring. And then, and then you would sort of um, look at this and then you should be able to, you will be able to make the connection between those events and what we are ex experiencing now um, in the world in terms of um, climate change. And then we will look at um, the impact of oil production in Nigeria on human, human development and the impact on the environment, um, agriculture and fishing its contribution to poverty, and then um, contribution to health, and then and human um, the humanitarian crisis that we have there. And then we will compare what is happening in Nigeria, how oil business is done in Nigeria, and how it is done here um, in the United States. Um, and then I will share a few um, solution ideas, and then um, also share with you. Um, what I have done, um, what I have done um, to help with this situation in Nigeria and beyond. So the goal of this presentation is to summarize and explain how oil uh, production in Nigeria impacts on human development and the climate in Africa, and I would say in Africa and beyond. Um, uh, when I was invited to present um, today, I was um, asked to make a link to the movie, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. So I, as you can see in that movie, if you have watched the movie, it's a very moving uh, movie. If you have not watched it, please watch it. Um, the extreme weather event in Malawi uh, that produced the drought and the drama that we see in the movie um, was a natural disaster from climate change. Uh, we see a lot of dust, we see a lot of um, suffering. People are moving away from um, their farms because their farms were no longer um, producing and there were, not, there were no more opportunities for them to, um, um, to plant and, and then to harvest crops to sustain themselves. So people were moving to the cities. And then the story I will share with you today is almost an entirely, is almost similar, um, but this is entirely a human-made, a human-made disaster uh, caused by the Nigerian government and a multinational oil companies like Shell, ExxonMobil, um, who have done similar things in other parts of the world, including places like Indonesia, um, Ecuador in the Amazon uh, region of the world, and many other places around the world. So this story from Nigeria uh, may be partly responsible for the disaster that we see in Malawi. Um, as you'll see, uh, you'll see the connection for yourself. Because Nigeria's pollution is, um, uh, partly responsible for uh, global warming in Africa and for uh, the global climate change um, around the world and in Africa. So I grew up in um, the southernmost part of Nigeria. This is um, where we have the red here. That's where oil comes from in Nigeria. That is the only place oil comes from in Nigeria. And then my home is just right here. This is Akwaibom State. This is where I come from. Um, and we were just there um, two, a year and a half ago with a colleague um, from DePaul University. So um, that is where all these things are happening. And before oil came, this is a rainforest. This is how the vegetation looked before oil came. You can see um, there is thick vegetation and then um, there is um, 
biodiversity, all forms of animals, plants, insects. Um, they were they were everywhere. Everywhere the millipedes were very long, and then the forests were very thick before oil came. Then the total population of that region is about 44 million people. And then um, considering that Nigeria's population now is between 190 million and 200 million. So you can see that um, that part of Nigeria is populated by minorities. So 20 ethnic, uh, ethnic groups make up that part of Nigeria and then they're all minority groups. So, um, and this is the third largest rainforest in the world. And then the fourth largest mangrove uh, forest um, in the world, which is um, um, really being threat threatened right now by hydrocarbons from oil pollution. So you can see how it is, um, um, it used to be. So growing up in Nigeria um, as a kid, um, oil was being presented as a blessing to us. When I was in high school, in elementary school, um, we were told that oil was a blessing and that the government and oil companies were our benefactors. So we used to go on um, field trips to the oil companies and then we would spend the day there and they would show us how the oil was um, extracted from the ground and then how the oil separates from, from the water. And then they would take us uh, through to show us how they, um, a lot of these things were manufactured um, in, in Port Harcourt, which was the biggest oil city in Nigeria. So um, oil companies um, were everywhere. In our villages, they had big trucks and many of our roads um, were not paved until recently. Um, many roads are still not paved. The road that crosses um, my house over there, um, I have a house over there, um, that road is not paved. And then um, when the oil companies really came and settled down, they um, implemented what is called eminent domain. Eminent domain allows the government to seize your land without your permission. And then they give that land to oil companies and they do not pay you. So it's called, they say the government has a right to um, your farmland if they discover that there's oil underneath, underneath your land. And then um, what they will do is they will bring uh, workers and they will cut down your crops. They'll destroy everything. And then they will use their big trucks and they bulldoze everything and they don't compensate you for, for that. So this picture is actually uh, where I went to school as um, a child. This, um, this is a picture I took um, at last year. You know, I took this picture in 2019, December 2019, when I was there. Um, I used to go to school here. So um, when oil came in, uh, my uncle was given, uh, because our land was also taken by oil companies, and then the only compensation they gave us was they bought a new bicycle, a very shiny bicycle for my uncle. And that cost like um, $100 today, that bicycle. Um, but then our land, as I understood it, produced about 1.5 million barrels of oil for Shell. The only thing my family got for, for, for that much of oil was $100 award uh, of bicycle. So and then I think everybody was experiencing this. And then um, as um, the oil companies and the government took over the place, um, there was um, increasing poverty and, uh, and hunger. And then because um, the farmlands were all polluted, um, when Shell or ExxonMobil or uh, Chevron, when they finished drilling for oil on your land, they will leave a big hole there. They will not cover up the hole. And they will leave the, everything standing there and all will continue to spill out of that hole. And they will leave everything there and, and, and move to another place and pollute another place. And they continue on and on and on. And that has been going on for almost 70 years now. So the villages were emptying out because there was nothing left for young people 
uh, people were moving to the big cities uh, to find jobs with the oil companies, jobs that really did not exist. So when I was growing up, um, I saw from time to time, um, when we were swimming um, in the rivers, when you come out of the water, your body will be shining like this. And then we always wondered what happened because we did not understand that all was leaking into the rivers. And then we were, we were drinking from that water and we were washing our clothes and swimming um, um, in, the same, in the same rivers. And when you, you come out, everything will look like this. And then your body will smell like kerosene. And then you wonder what is going on? The drinking water will smell like, smell like kerosene. I see them, things were not, things were not the same. So, um, and then only later did I understand that um, about oil pollution. And that was um, when I was in, in university that I learned about oil pollution and then I began to understand what was going on there. And then in the eighties, in the eighties, I was um, really um, part of the movement that demanded that um, oil companies and the government do the right thing and cl clean up after themselves. But that did not happen. So I'll now talk about the oil economy and then in Nigeria. So Nigeria is a big producer of oil in the world. It's a major player in the world. The total output um, is um, like 2.3 million barrels every day. That's how much oil they produce. It is the largest producer, producer of oil in Africa. Um, the 13th largest producer in the world. Um, they could have been maybe around the 10th or the 9th, but because of constant instability that some wells are not as short because community, communities are not letting them um, drill in some places because of all these problems. So Nigeria also produces about 1.2 billion cubic feet of uh, natural gas. And then Nigeria is the 12th largest producer of natural gas in the world. So you can see here, oil is very important to the Nigerian economy. Um, it contributes um, about 98% of um, Nigeria's export earnings about 83% of federal government revenue and 40% of the GDP of uh, that country and 95% of foreign exchange earnings and 65% of government budgetary uh, revenues. So without oil um, in Nigeria, there would, the government would be very, very weak. Um, probably that would not be a bad thing because it might um, also um, force the government to look elsewhere for, for revenue, maybe to develop agriculture more um, or do uh, something else um, to, um, to find money to run things in the country. So there are pros and cons, and, and cons um, to over de uh, depending on oil. Um, um, it produces uh, the foreign exchange that the government wants. That's a, that's a plus for the government, I would imagine. And then um, it really contributes to the GDP. Uh, that is a plus. But um, if you know um, places that have oil around the world, especially in Nigeria, you may have heard a lot about um, Russia, the corruption that you find in Russia, the corruption that you find in other places. In Nigeria, there is what is called um, what I would call um, corruption on, st on steroids. So Nigerian government, um, they can just dip into the treasury and they steal in billions of dollars. I'm not, talk I'm not lying to you. Um, there's um, a government uh, official who stole $6 billion um, just a few years ago. So they're stealing, um, if somebody steals a million dollars in Nigeria, um, in Nigeria that's, a, that's a cent. That's a very holy person. Um, they're stealing billions um, because of the oil. So oil brings corruption to the country. Then it brings forceful eviction of the poor from their, from their resources, from their land. 
the landowners are thrown off their lands, the farmers are, um, they ha have their lands taken away from them, their crops are destroyed. The land, the air, the water is, pollute, um, is polluted. And then there's um, um, a kind of militarization of um, that entire region in Nigeria, where um, the armed forces, you can you find them everywhere. Um, there are police uh, checkpoints everywhere. And then um, until recently, there was armed resistance by the people who, um, who felt that they produce the oil and they get nothing from it. So um, all this can be a blessing, um, like we sometimes see here in the United States. Um, and then it could also be a curse like we sometimes see here in the United States. Um, but in Nigeria, all is more of a curse than a blessing. So let's look now at the links uh, between Nigerian oil and the global and US economy. As you can see here, um, I don't know whether Organization of Petroleum um, Export Countries, and um, we call them OPEC. You can see here, that um, Nigeria, is, um, Nigeria is up here. Um, Nigeria, has, um, Nigeria is a member of this uh, organization. And you can see here that the demand for oil is still going up, it's still going up. And then um, North America, where we are now, uh, still has the highest demand for oil. Um, you can see here, and then um, we have uh, Asia and Pacific. And that, that would be because of China and India. Um, the United States, uh, Canada, Mexico, um, and um, they, they have, a, they still have a large appetite for, for oil, even though we are talking about um, moving to renewable energy uh, sources, but there's still that high demand for oil. And you can see that the United States um, is, um, the top consumer of oil in the world, followed by China and then Japan and then India and so forth and Russia. So, so this is where the United States um, imported most of its oil until recently, which is around 2013, 2014, um, Nigeria supplied was the fourth largest supplier of oil to the United States. So that shows you that uh, Nigeria is a big player. Um, Nigeria has been a big player, a big supplier of oil to the United States for many, many years. Um, and then um, it's right after Saudi Arabia. And then as you see uh, next, um, you see that Saudi Arabia contributed 22% of US oil, um, imports. And then Nigeria contributed the same amount um, as Saudi Arabia. But people know a lot about Saudi Arabia um, sending oil to the United States, selling oil to the United States, but nobody really knew that Nigeria was sending the same amount of oil that Saudi Arabia was sending to the United States. So it is a big player um, in this context. And then the, uh, the biggest oil company in Nigeria is a US company, which is ExxonMobil, then followed by um, Shell, which used to be the biggest. And Shell is registered here in this country as well. And um, a company like Chevro Chevron, uh, which is also um, a part of this country, the United States. So you can see here that during between 2000, um, 2010, and then 2014. So the US import of Nigerian uh, oil, um, Canada 2015, it went down. And this is um, um, these three years or four years, it went down between 2012 and 2015. But then from 2016, it um, they started, um, importing oil from the US started importing oil from Nigeria again. And then um, this year, um, uh, not much business was done probably or in 2020, 
not much business was done maybe because of COVID-19, everything was locked down. Um, but Nigeria still sends oil to the United States. So Nigeria is the third largest supplier of liquefied uh, natural gas to the United States after Trinidad and uh, Egypt. That was until um, 2012. That's the period that we saw here, um, things began to change um, because there was too much criticism, uh, human rights abuses in Nigeria and the whole world was angry at what is going on in Nigeria. So the US pulled back and then they imported more oil from Canada and from Mexico. Um, and then they imported less uh, from Nigeria. But um, uh, currently the, the Nigeria um, does not supply much, almost zero um, natural gas to the United States, but the bulk um, of that supply goes to Europe, uh, European countries, uh, a country like France, uh, Spain, and then other European countries, and then um, to Asian countries in Asia Pacific. So we will now look at um, the toll that oil is production in Nigeria is taking on the environment. Um, we traveled there, um, uh, Dr. Um, Margaret Walkman, who I believe is um, on this present uh, presentation. Dr. Walkman is a professor, a professor at, um, at DePaul University. So she and I um, traveled to Nigeria. We actually went and saw, um, visited some of these um, for pollution, uh, polluted sites. And then we saw some of this, these things um, that I'm going to tell you. So the BBC described Nigeria um, a few years ago as the world oil pollution capital. So that shows you, um, everybody knows about this. Um, uh, it is uh, the most polluted place on earth by oil. It is the most polluted place in the world by oil. So there are two um, principal um, oil pollution pathways in Nigeria. The one is through oil spills, and then the other one is through gas flaring. And then between 1970 and 2020, there were more than 800,000 tons, tons of oil spilled in Nigeria and about 650 billion cubic feet of uh, gas flared in Nigeria. So that is um, the second uh, worst, um, the, sec the, se the, the second worst in the world after Russia. And then Nigeria has the worst oil spill profile in the world by far. So, and you can see when you go there, um, travel there, um, the rivers we are used to swim, um, that river is completely closed. No one can go near because it's uh, now very toxic. And then there's no more fish in that river. Um, you go to many rivers that are like that. Um, and then sections of the country, the, the World Health Organization, and then the United Nations Environmental Program, they recommended that no one should go um, near those places, that human beings should be evacuated because of pollution. So about 800 million gallons of oil, um, ex excluding uh, toxic waste, have been spilled in Nigeria. So imagine that, 800 gallons, 800 million gallons. And these um, 800 million gallons of oil, um, only less than 1 million has been cleaned up for almost um, 65 years, for almost 65 years. Only 1 million um, barrel, about only 1 million gallons of oil have been cleaned up which means that about 700 million gallons have not been cleaned and then it's still there. Um, then oil spills contaminate um, the region and then, and then there are high levels of, just a second here. So oil contaminates the region's water with high levels of hydrocarbons. And then um, in 2011, the United Nations Environmental uh, Program estimated that um, they did a study and then they said that 
Um, even the underground water in Nigeria, uh, in the Niger Delta, is contaminated by about 3.1 um, inches um, of, of oil, refined oil. It's flowing underground. It's flowing underground, which means that if you dig a hole, um, if you dig a well in Nigeria, you cannot even drink from that well because the well is polluted by oil. The surface water where we used to swim is polluted. The underground water is also polluted. So, um, and then it was recommended by the United Nations that the government and all companies should supply uh, bottled water to people for, uh, and they have not done that up till now, since 2011. And people are still drinking this. Um, they are still drinking this polluted water since that time. So when you compare, look at it. I don't know how many of us here are old enough to remember uh, the disaster, the Exxon Valdez um, disaster in Alaska, um, which was um, which happened, I believe, in 1989. That disaster, all disasters, spilled um, about 11 million um, um, barrels, I believe, barrels of oil. 11 million gallons of oil into, um, into the Prince, Prince William Sound in Alaska in 1989. So that type of event happens every year in Nigeria, every year. There's that amount, there's, there's always a big event like that happening where that amount of oil is spilled at one time every year, excluding other smaller spills excluding other smaller spills that are going on um, in that country um, every year. So this is us here, you see, this is me. Um, this is uh, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Walkman. And then um, these are community um, um, environmentalists in Nigeria. So we went to, um, to visit the first oil well that was, um, drilled in, in Nigeria. So this is the second oil well that you see here. This is the second oil well that was drilled there. And then uh, this is the first on the left. This is the first that was drilled there. And this build thing you see here, um, I'm going to explain to you here. The Nigerian president went because in 2001, if parts of the Niger Delta was shut down, the people did not allow oil companies to go to drill anymore. They picked up arms and they say, you are killing us. Get out of our communities. So the Nigerian government went there and they said, they promised we are going to do this for you. We are going to build this for you. We are going to give you this amount of money from now on, things will be done differently. And they went and put up this flag, what you are seeing here. And then this flag, what is here reads, Oloibiri Millennium Landmark Projects. Nigeria's first oil well, 1956, laying the foundation stone of Oloibiri Oil and Gas Research Institute by His Excellency Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, President, Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, Federal Republic of Nigeria on March two, 2001. To the glory of God and service to the Niger Delta people of Nigeria. So they promised to build that institute. And then since 2001 till today, this is the institute that you are seeing here. This is the building. So this building here represents the institute that they promised. So as you can see, um, the institute was not built. None of the projects that the government has promised or the oil companies have promised, none of them has been done um, uh, in any meaningful way. So the Nigerian president lied and lied over and over and over and over to uh, the people in this region that we are going to make things better. We are going to change uh, this world. Uh, we are going to clean up the oil, the, the spills, but they never do that. They never do that. I mean, 2000, um, 2014, um, I called the United Nations um, United Program in Nairobi, and they were still waiting for the Nigerian government to clean up the region. I told them they are not going to clean up the region. And then they said, 
are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. And they said, talk to our people in Geneva. And they gave me the phone number and I called the people in Geneva. And I talked to them and they said, we don't want to talk to you. You don't know what you are talking about. The Nigerian government are going to, they have given us the award. But between, since 2014, they have, this has not been cleaned up. So exactly what I told the United Nations um, is what is going on today. Nothing has been cleaned up um, and it's still um, the same story. So during that trip we made in 2019, we also met with, um, went to the office of um, one environmental group here. Um, what you are seeing here at the bottom are samples um, that they have collected over the years because the oil company always asks them, produce the evidence that we are polluting this area, that we are polluting the land, that we are polluting the water. Show us the evidence and then we will do something about it. So they went around, they collected all this evidence. The fact is that they do not have the equipment to test the evidence. So um, they, they have collected the data, but they cannot test it. They cannot produce any uh, findings. And then the oil companies will say, well, you see that there's no evidence. Um, there's no, we cannot produce any evidence that we are causing any, any harm. Therefore, um, leave us alone. So they showed us um, all these uh, bottles contain um, samples from different locations where um, different sites uh, where they have, um, there were spills within the last, um, the last three years. So we now will discuss gas flaring uh, because oil spills um, are not the only sources of, um, of pollution in that region of the world. We also have gas flaring, um, which is when um, oil is being drilled, there are all types of gases that, um, that come out from the ground. And then in the United States and many other countries, they capture the gas and then they turn it into what we use now to heat our homes or to cook or to do other things with um, the gas that we, what we call natural gas. But in Nigeria, they flare the gas, they burn it, they burn it off. It is only now that they are starting to um, capture a little bit of it and then um, sell it to other countries. But for many years, for over 50 years, they burned off the gas. So it flares, uh, Nigeria used to flare about 80% um, until um, 2018. They flared about 80% um, um, until around 2004. And then between then and 2018, they flare about 70% of the natural gas. And up to today, um, they still flare about 70% uh, of the natural gas. And then, um, it is the second biggest gas flare in the world, like I, I showed you before. Um, and then um, you can see here from space, um, the, this is um, a picture from NASA. Um, they captured the gas flares from Nigeria from space. This is not electricity. This is gas flares from Nigeria. Uh, what you are seeing here. Um, and then let me show you uh, more of that. Um, this is also, um, captured uh, by NASA from space, um, gas flares from Nigeria. So Dr. Udo, it's 710. Is, uh? So Dr. Udo, okay. it's 710. Okay. So gas is flared um, every day, um, always, um, day and night. And then it's always daytime where this is happening. It's never nighttime, it's like, um, summer in Alaska. Um, and then the temperatures are so high. As you can see here, gas is flared very close to where people live, not, um, not in the forest somewhere, very close to where people live. And this is very hot. And then um, people just go there. They, they are not being educated about the dangers of this. And they just think that they can just go and dry their stuff around these, um, these flares. So oil production in Nigeria accounts for more greenhouse gas emissions um, than all other sources uh, in sub-Saharan Africa combined. So you can see here, um, 
uh, it, it produces many of these toxic uh, gases. Um, the gas it produces this and this, all of these contribute to what we call um, uh, climate change in Africa and climate change around the world. You can see gas being flared around where people live. So it's like this, um, it's like this in those places all the time. So let's uh, quickly look at the, uh, the impacts. So environmental impact um, include um, what you are seeing here, um, deforestation, acid rain, um, erosion, flooding, um, and then depletion of uh, biodiversity, and they all contribute to global warming and then to climate change. And then we, um, here in the United States, you will not imagine uh, gas pipelines running through um, your, your home in front of your house. But this is what is happening um, in Nigeria. Um, and then uh, because of this, um, Nigeria has lost nearly 80% of its old growth forest. Um, and then, um, and this is the highest deforestation rate um, of natural forest um, in the world um, during that period. So these are the socioeconomic compact, uh, impacts, um, eminent domain that I discussed before uh, leading to degradation of um, sustainable livelihood. They take uh, your farm, you have nothing to, um, nothing to, to do. You have no, no, no work. And then people migrate to uh, different places. And then the women are trafficked. And then um, they are trafficked to Europe. I'm going to show you the pathways that that takes um, very shortly. And then um, a lot of people die from this, um, from loss of hope. And then the farmers, um, the far, those who, uh, most of those who, are, uh, who, who do fishing um, are women. 75% of the farmers are women. And then um, that includes also about 65% of those who, who fish in that region of the world. So um, you can see um, this increase in unemployment um, because of um, this type of situation. The fact that everything is taken away from people by all companies and the government. And then because of that, there's this um, high unemployment in that part of Nigeria. So you can see also um, that there is um, very um, high cases of um, girls being trafficked from the oil, um, from the oil producing areas of Nigeria, and then they are trafficked to um, to Europe um, through Libya, and then they are trafficked into Italy, into Spain, into uh, many of those countries, and then um, they have this traffic. You can see that this thing here. This is the Niger Delta. This is how they go. They take them through um, many of these countries, through Libya here. And you can see um, the live from Benin City, which is um, not far from where I come from, where I was born. And then they go all the way to Malta. From Malta, they go to um, different parts of Europe. And then they stand on the streets as prostitutes, um, as sex workers. I'm sorry to say that. So as sex workers. So we also have health impacts, um, skin diseases, uh, poverty, hunger, um, arising from many of these things. Um, then like we saw already, uh, human trafficking. And then we see um, inequality. Then there's the death of manufacturing and agriculture uh, results in violent conflict in that part of the country. And then the, those who are engaged in that conflict often uh, rape, uh, rape a lot of people and then they kill a lot of people and then people get infected with um, deadly diseases um, like um, HIV, which, is, um, which has the highest um, rate of um, transmission and infection in this part of, of, of Nigeria. So I'll quickly, before I end, um, look compare what we see here in the United States, what we have here around Ch the Chicago area here and what is happening um, out there. Um, in Chicago, we, we have problems with pet coke. Um, don't know what, um, how many of you have heard of pet coke. Um, is um, what we see here, black, um, 
black uh, sands that is um, produced from refined by refineries during the process of refining um, uh, very heavy um, heavy oil. So and then this um, this sand um, is also used in place of um, coal. They use it to, um, uh, to they, they use it to to fire power plants. And then we have a problem with that um, in Chicago. And they have, we have mountains of these sands. Um, we used to have them in the southeast part of Chicago. And when the wind comes, it will blow like you are seeing here in this picture. You will blow the sand and then cover that whole area. But um, um, you see that the city of Chicago did something and then they banned um, one of those plants. And then we have um, some incidents of oil spills here but uh, the EPA has always um, um, done it, what we call a, a good job um, to compare to what we have in Nigeria to clean up as quickly as possible. So we compare it to um, what happened in um, uh, the BP oil spill uh, in 2010, which uh, spilled like 184 million gallons of oil um, into the Gulf um, of Mexico. And then um, um, BP paid dearly for that. Um, they paid billions of dollars for that. And they, they cleaned up, um, even though the impact is still there, but they did uh, make an effort to clean up that. Um, um, and then you can see here that uh, I told you before that um, what, happened, what, the, what happened with BP and what happened with Exxon Val Exxon Valdez um, is just a minuscule of what we, um, we see in, in Nigeria. So uh, BP paid dearly, like $65 billion um, they have paid so far um, to help uh, clean up um, uh, the, the Gulf and then also to pay compensation. But in Nigeria, they were proposing a billion dollars um, to clean up um, um, that, that uh, the Niger Delta, and still that billion dollars has not been allocated up till today. Um, <clears throat> so how do they compare? Um, um, we have um, spills here in the United States range from small spills to major disasters that we have seen. And then there's always prompt government action and then prompt remediation action from oil companies and then public outcry always drives a positive, positive change in the United States. And then in Nigeria, we have um, spills that range from small events to mega disasters. And then there's always government cover up and then all industry bribes and, 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 and threatens um, people to avoid a remediation and accountability. And then public outcry is always suppressed with soldiers. And then, and the police, um, and all of this is always paid for by uh, oil companies. And then you can see here Shell um, paid um, $15.5 uh, million uh, a few years ago um, over their complicity in the killing of um, Ken Sarawiwa. Um, I don't know whether you know. This was a major um, environmental activist in Nigeria who was killed by Ni the Nigerian government. He was hanged by the Nigerian government. But recently, a few weeks ago, um, the protests by the native people in the United States against the Keystone Pipeline prompted um, uh, Joe Biden, President Biden. He, he signed uh, papers and then said that project will not go ahead because he listened, to, um, he listened to the voices of the people. Um, you can see here, um, BP cleaned up consistently for three years and then they stopped and then they handed that over to the states to continue cleaning up. Um, here in Nigeria, um, in Nigeria, there's always a cover up. Um, and then all companies do everything possible to avoid um, clean up, cleaning up the place. So I have the following um, recommendations, um, recommendations that we can use um, because many people here in the United States have shares 
in um, these oil companies, um, the shareholders, um, the home government of these companies, and then the international um, the community can pressure these companies to uh, be more responsible, more transparent, and more ethical in their business practices in Nigeria. And then there should be pressure on the Nigerian government um, through um, the US uh, Congress, which has a big sway um, over the Nigerian government to respect the human and environmental rights of the Niger Delta people. There should be gr uh, greater global cooperation against corruption, um, authoritarianism, and human and environmental rights abuses. And then there should be training and empowerment of community activists to collect and analyze environmental data so that they can organize and advocate for themselves and their environment. So I recommend that we should teach adolescents and youth about environmental conservation and advocacy um, here in the United States and in Nigeria and um, everywhere else. And then we should also teach jobs uh, skills um, to unemployed women um, and youth and those who are uh, forcefully displaced um, and whose farmlands have been taken away by government in Nigeria and taken away by um, oil companies um, in Nigeria for the purpose of drilling for oil. Um, and then I also think that resources should be made available for self-empowerment and community engagement, resources such as community libraries and then resource centers and so forth. Um, these are some recommended uh, um, suggested readings um, that I have. So you might be wondering what have I done? I'll quickly talk about that like two minutes or one minute. Um, what have I done myself? Um, I have been working with um, environmental groups and with colleagues at uh, DePaul University to try to um, develop programs that we can implement um, in Nigeria to teach young people, to teach elementary school students, university students, and the prim primary school or high school students about environmental conservation. And then we are also working on empowering um, um, community-based organizations and activists so that they will, um, uh, we will find a way to provide them with um, um, the way of conducting a test, scientific test of any, any sample that they collect so that they can have evidence to uh, present to um, all companies and the government. Um, and then uh, recently, um, while visiting Nigeria, like we saw in, in the movie um, that we started out with the movie, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind in Malawi, um, what helped that boy was the fact that he was able to um, access a library in Malawi. And then when he accessed the library, he was able to find resources that helped him develop, um, create a windmill that was able to um, pump so, water so, from, so, from the ground. So um, most recently, I have been working with people and then I working with um, a colleagues here in the United States with Books for Africa. Um, you can see here, this is, um, these are books in my house in Nigeria. And we have here up to um, 23,000 books. We have 23,000 books here in these boxes. And they were, these boxes were shipped from uh, Minneapolis uh, my, um, I used to, when I was in Fargo, I knew them very well. So they shipped these boxes, uh, um, they produced the books and we shipped these boxes of books to Nigeria uh, a few years ago, um, like three, three years ago. So my, my dream is to uh, build a community library, a big library and really big center that can serve as a resource center for young people, for activists, for all sorts of people over there so that they can uh, gather and then discuss these things. Because as, as you are seeing here, um, the schools are not doing well. Um, the libraries, um, let me show you one example. This is, um, this is one school library. This is a library, believe it or not, it's empty. This is what they call a library. 
and there is not a single book here. So, so if there are books, if there's a library, if there's something like that um, available, then um, a lot of things can change. But what made it possible for me to come here to the United States, for me to be able to speak here today and to teach at these fine universities is the fact that I had access to books and I was able to read anything that I laid my hand on, my hands on. I was able to read and read and read and read. And that helped me break, break out of that cycle of poverty. So, um, so that is what I'm planning to do to get people together and then create a library where young people can go and read and then empower themselves and dream about a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Udo. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, first of all, um, Lucy is asking about the if one property or being that property was seized, um, uh, how and people were not compensated. In those cases, what did people who were forced to evacuate do? Um, people who were forced to evacuate, um, they, they would do nothing because um, when they seize the property, they have soldiers with them. Uh, and then they'll station the soldiers there permanent, permanently um, until the project, is, the project is completed. So you will not have a voice. In many cases, when they seize your property, if you complain, they will, um, they will kick you out of the community. So they will use soldiers and the police. And then if you continue to complain and don't move, then you, they will kill you. They will shoot you. So it's a, it's a very uh, military type operation. The oil companies um, own the military uh, in Nigeria. And then they use them to threaten the people and take their resources from them. OK. Thank you. And Karen asked, uh, why do you think Nigeria is the most polluted country in the world? And if, first of all, if there's an opportunity to tighten environmental regulations to reduce that pollution, or if there's a way of holding the companies responsible for cleanup. And also Karen Baran also asked the, the same thing, how, if any big oil companies have been reprimanded for their wrongdoings. Um, the companies have been reprimanded um, the Nigerian government has passed laws, um, but at the level of enforcement, these laws are not enforced because um, the oil companies would take, um, let's say um, recently, um, ExxonMobil is still battling in court, um, but they were, they were accused of um, bribing um, some people in government up to $1.6 billion. Wow. So they would take this money and then they will bribe the the law enforcement people, and then they will not enforce those um, regula regulations. So it is a, a system of bribery um, that is perpetrated by uh, mostly Shell um, in Nigeria and ExxonMobil. And then they bribe, um, they bribe the courts. Um, for example, Shell, um, Ex Shell was um, actually um, asked to pay the equivalent of um, it was um, 50,000 Nigerian Naira, which is equivalent of, um, at that time, it was like um, um, $250, I believe, $250. And then Shell argued in court that if they are asked to pay that money to the owners of the land, that they would go bankrupt. That was what Shell said. Wow. That if they, are, if they are forced to pay $250, to the owner of the land that they would go bankrupt. And then they bribed the judge and they did not pay that money. Okay, okay it's 7.30, if anybody needs to leave, we of course understand if anybody wants to stay, there's a couple more questions. And if you have other questions, you can unmute yourself. So um, um, one of the, uh, of the questions was also, if there is any way like uh, of, of cleaning up, if there's any, if, if um, if there's any way of tightening those environmental regulations, or is that also a matter of, of you know, government being bribed and nobody wanting to do anything about that? There's, there's a way of cleaning up, um, but then um, the UN was supposed to, the United Nations was supposed to um, um, organize that effort, but then the United States, uh, the United Nations 
as with everything with the United Nations, which is um, sometimes it is a good organization, sometimes the UN is not effective. So the UN delegated that mission to the Nigerian government. Mm. And then um, and the Nigerian government has not cleaned up um, up till now. Okay. So they, um, there's no way you can force the Nigerian government to clean up. Um, Sometimes they say they are cleaning up, they allocate the money to clean up, and then the money will disappear. So um, um, the best, the only way this can be done is for the international community um, to, to, to become involved in the cleanup exercise. Um, and then if they can become involved, then that will happen. But if they leave it to the local actors alone mm. to clean up the place, it will not happen. Okay. What about renewable energy? Is that something that uh, is Nigeria thinking about in any way? Well, some people are um, actually using solar panels. Um, there's a place I went to, let me see what I can show you. Um, I went to, um, when I was in Nigeria a few, um, in 2018, I went to visit my friend. Um, my friend is um, is a, a rector of a, a school, a junior college. Mm -hmm. And then he was using um, solar panels to he was using solar panels to um, to power the the whole school. I was very impressed um, that he was doing that. And then let me see whether I have it here. Well, I don't have it here, but um, it, uh, that is being done, um, but it's very expensive over there. So, so that only um, institutions like that are considering uh, sol solar panels. And then um, um, I hear that a few, a few um, wealthy people have also installed um, solar panels. Mm -hmm. But I've not seen anything about like windmill, which is something I have been thinking about um, also. Um, but many of these places um, in the Niger Delta, um, there's no electricity. Um, many homes, I would say 90% of the homes are not electrified. Um, in spite of the fact that they live in an ocean of um, energy. Yeah. They produce oil and natural gas in abundance, but they do not have electricity in their homes. Wow. So, um, so renewable energy is something that um, they have people have talked about, but it's not widely implemented yet. Okay, okay. I don't know if anybody has any questions. They want to if they want to unmute themselves and and ask. If not. I think this has been a really amazing and eye-opening talk. I think we've learned a lot about what we should learn more about. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udo. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I have a question. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. We talk about this renewable. <clears throat> My concern is about the demand because th my feeling thought is that uh, it's kind of like the drugs in the United States come to the United States. If you reduce the demand, you have more control. And I, I, I'm not certain that, that, that folks will give up the demand less Amer since America is essentially the number one country on the planet that's consuming vast amounts of energy. That's up, that's up. To reduce our demand might have more of an impact, but that always also contention with with that would mean that we have to give up a whole lot. And I am less inclined to feel that uh, by and large, the people in the United States are gonna give up that kind of, that kind of thing. They're gonna mm -hmm. give it up. So I, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I, I hadn't been to Nigeria many years ago. I was living in Senegal and I took a trip across Senegal, Mali, uh, and I went to Niger. Uh, you know, not, not quite to Ag uh, Agadez, but I did see, didn't see oil, but I did, did see certainly and spent time uh, in that desert region and knowing something about um, 
the issues regarding uh, uh, the importance of renewable energy, the you know uh, the devast climate devastation. This was many years ago. Uh, I'm just afraid that, um, and, and I also, and then later on, I met a man who, here in Chicago who was a, became a refugee and Angoni fellow because he was an activist in the Delta Niger region and got in trouble and, ha and had to flee to Kenya and then eventually made it to the States. Um, so you know, I, I don't really understand your question. I, yeah, I so could you possibly, can he speak to that? Could, uh, could the doctor speak to that? Because um, I, I don't know how we would work around that without somehow addressing the demand issues. Yeah, I, I think you are, you are right. Um, Nigeria doesn't even, um, people don't even have electricity in their homes with um, um, non-renewable energies so abundantly available. Nigeria doesn't even, the refineries are dead. They, they send the oil to Britain and then they refine it in Britain and bring it back and sell to the Nigerian people. The reason they do that um, is because um, they can inflate the cost. Um, when the, the, the finished product comes back into the country. So it's a, it, it, it's a, a scheme, a corruption scheme. Um, that's why they allow the, the refineries to die. Um, so these, the people in Nigeria are, um, let me say, the poverty rate is um, I'm approaching 70% um, in the last uh, few years. Um, so people are not that, um, people are not, that well to do, and they will not, they will probably not be able to afford the, the cost of um, um, solar panels or other types of renewable energy, unless there is um, a subsidy. Um, if it's subsidized um, by government or maybe by some, uh, some people in the international community, if they subsidize that then, People will welcome anything. They will welcome anything that will light up their homes. Because even when I go home and then um, into my house, my house is fairly, fairly big, bigger than my house here. Um, and then when I go there, um, I have to use the power ge the generator to power the house. I have to use diesel. I have to buy diesel. And diesel is very expensive over there. So, um, and then, uh, so if I, if uh, renewable energy sources are available, um, like let's say the windmill, uh, solar panel, then um, that is something, if I have the money, that's something I would consider. But at this moment, um, I would say 97% of Nigerians, um, they will not afford to, um, to have that done, um, even though they will welcome it if it is available. They welcome anything that will light up the house, that will allow power um, appliances in their homes, because yeah. people are tired of buying petrol and buying um, diesel. Okay, but well, they've been talking about they've been talking about renewable energy, literally for decades. I remember as a young twenty-year-old when they were talking about there were sites of uh, renewable energy and the importance of desertification. How is the world community? And, and you know, you'd mentioned when you called Geneva, they basically ignored you because they didn't want to get involved with that. How can we pressure the world community? You can pressure the world community. The United States has the key, holds the key to uh, these problems. Um, I'm not trying to put responsibility on the American people, but the American government has a lot of power in what's going on in Nigeria. Those, um, um, the, the oil companies have been protected by the U.S. government over the years. And through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, the United States government was uh, a toppling government, deposing government in Nigeria. Uh, any government that will resist anything, they will arrange for that government to be brought down, then they will, there will be a military coup until um, the late 80s and early 90s. That was the truth. Um, but now the United States still has the sway. If the United States would um, put the foot down and say enough, it's enough, this has to stop, then it will stop. 
believe me. But so it, it has to, they have to see it as a priority and then and recognize um, the damage that ExxonMobil is doing and then tell ExxonMobil um, maybe have some sanctions for um, any damage that they cause abroad or something like that. So if they go after ExxonMobil uh, for uh, making these things happen, making a global warming worse, um, then it will stop, it will stop. Um, the Nigerian government is not that strong. It's, um, mm. it's just, a, um, it's just a, a dependent on like every other person on um, the mercy of the oil companies. They don't want to upset the oil companies because they always threaten if you, if you do this, we are going to pull out and they don't want them to pull out. So, but if the US government and the European Union, um, the European government, if the Canadian government, if they put their foot down, then all this will stop. The Chinese are doing a lot of things in Africa, um, but if, they, if um, the US and the euro said enough is enough, then China will not by itself continue causing the damage that they are also causing in Africa. So yes. Yeah, Kellyanne comments that it's our extreme consumerism, American greed and rugged individualism is problematic and is killing the earth. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Udo. I I think we could all, you know, continue with this conversation. Uh, a lot of people did sign and write their emails. So any further questions or anything that they might have or that you might want to add, I will be happy to share. And this talk will be uh, on our YouTube channel uh, probably next week. So if you need to review it or share it, please feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Rudo. Thank you. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. There is one more comment. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Mm. I'm impressed you didn't need to drink. No, I was. Uh... Oh, I think, I'm sorry. I don't know if there's a lady that wants to speak, Ms. Sheree Lockett. I don't know if her yes. hand is up. I can't hear yes. you. Yes, You're yes. muted. All oh, right. I'm sorry. Do you know Eddie Kaka? No, I don't. Okay, I'm just wondering if somebody I worked with many years ago who was the refugee, became a refugee because he okay. was an activist in uh -huh. the Delta region. Mm -hmm. And I did, I think he got a master's at DePaul. Okay. But he was, I had an extensive conversation about that. But thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank for you. Coming. Thank Bye. you. Dr. Udo, if you want, tomorrow we can debrief. Okay. Okay, and I'll send you the list of the you students. Send me something and then we can debrief. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so okay. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice okay, evening. Bye -bye. You too.